Imagine a man left for more than a month in a remote desert, parched landscape everywhere he looks. He's suddenly been taken away from his friends, his family, the comforts of home. Unlike any time in this man's life previous to this experience, he is now engaged in trying to survive scrounging for food where it does not exist, living off whatever he can find, struggling to extract enough clean water to keep himself alive. No shelter awaits him. He has to come up with a makeshift alternative to keep himself covered and safe. Every day and night he's fighting the elements, the sun burning his skin, the dust flying in his face all day long. The bugs are biting and the wildlife all around him seems threatening. To make matters worse, this environment seems to bring out all the character flaws that this man was sure that he never had. He went into this feeling like he was on the right track, but all of the sudden, the desires that he had banished away come to the surface again. This austere and disciplined life he'd achieved starts falling apart when he finds himself tempted to sell his soul for just a slice of bread. And this man is surrounded by voices of greed and jealousy, dishonesty, competition. He's drawn into the temptation of giving up everything for what looks off in the distance like utter happiness and total fulfillment. I don't know about you, but I love the TV show Survivor. <laughs> Perhaps it's more shallow theological mind that hears the recounting of Jesus's temptation in the desert and thinks immediately of watching television. But here we are starting Lent and I thought I would begin this morning with that confession. With the reminder of Jesus's temptation in the desert on our minds this morning, I welcome you to this first Sunday in the season of Lent, a season that began this past Wednesday and lasts for 40 days as we follow Jesus toward Jerusalem, toward the cross. The theme guiding our Lenten practice as a worshiping community this year is holy conversations. I hope that you've had an opportunity to pick up the Riverside devotional booklet that we wrote together and begin reading along every day with the reflections of your fellow church members. And I was so glad to see so many of you here on Friday night, a very, very cold night indeed, when we heard some phenomenal voices in conversation with the liturgy of the church. Seven last words calling us to confession repentance, action. It's conversations like these with God and with each other that help us change course, shift perspective, move more deeply into an awareness of God's work in the world and in our lives. And so we continue the conversation this morning with the story of Jesus spending 40 days in the desert, a familiar passage that the church traditionally reads every year on this first Sunday of Lent. Matthew, Mark, Luke, all three of the synoptic gospels tell this story. You heard Reverend James read earlier in the worship service Matthew's recounting of events. Recall what happened to Jesus. After his riveting birth narrative, John the Baptist suddenly appears and begins preaching and baptizing, and an adult Jesus himself then appears on the scene, jumps into the river with John and baptized, comes up dripping, conviction burning in his gut, his heart pulled towards something something he couldn't quite see, but felt more strongly than he'd ever felt anything in his life before. He was ready to follow. He was ready to do whatever it was going to take. He was ready to answer that conviction in his soul. And the text says next that the spirit led him out into the wilderness where he wandered for 40 days with little to eat, listening, listening, listening. And what was he trying to hear, do you think? The text doesn't say, but if I had to, I'd guess he was waiting for direction. Direction. 
an assignment maybe. It wouldn't have to come in explicit words per se. A dream would be great or maybe an idea. Even just a hunch might have assured him that God was showing up in conversation with him, ready to lead him to great things. But you'll recall it was 40 days in the desert, parched, alone, afraid, and not one word from God. As I've already pointed out, Lent is a season of confession, so I have another confession to make. You heard Matthew's version of the story earlier, but the actual assigned text from the lectionary this year comes from Mark's gospel. Here's how Mark tells it. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan and he was with the wild beasts. I asked for Matthew's version to be read because I wanted all of us to have a bigger picture of the details of Jesus' experience, but it's interesting to note that Mark just kind of skips over the whole thing. He gets Jesus in and out of the desert in less than two verses. And you know, I think that's important to note, maybe because the writer of Mark was thinking something like I was. 40 days in the desert, 40 days of angst and fear and confusion and seeking and no word from God? Let's just move along, can we? I don't know about you, but I'd prefer not to dwell on God's silence. But as we are beginning Lent, living these 40 days of darkness and confession, confronting our mortality and listening intently for conversations that help us see our way. Well, what are we supposed to do when we're in the middle of a wasteland like this, hoping for a holy conversation and God is silent? Episcopal priest and author Barbara Brown Taylor writes, very few people come to see me because they want to discuss something God said to them last night. The large majority come because they can't get God to say anything at all. Isn't that our shared human experience? From Philip Yancey's Where is God When It Hurts to the sonnets of John Donne to Lucy Shaw's God in the Dark to the anguished letters of Mother Teresa. It seems like it's part of our shared experience to crave holy conversations with the divine or at least something just a word or two to help us know we're on the right track. But sometimes all we can hear is empty, yawning silence. Perhaps one of recent history's deepest expressions of anguish over God's silence comes from the story of Elie Wiesel. I'm sure many of you know Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Prize winning author, teacher, and activist famous for his memoir, Night, which you hopefully read in some English class somewhere along the way. At the age of 15, Wiesel and his entire family were sent to Auschwitz during the Holocaust and after undergoing horrific suffering, he was finally released in 1945. Almost his entire family were killed. Wiesel wrote Night, a memoir in which he speaks so deeply and hauntingly about the silence of God. Listen. Then came the march past the victims. The two men were no longer alive. Their tongues were hanging out, swollen and bluish. But the third rope was still moving. The child, too light, was still breathing. And so he remained for more than half an hour, lingering between life and death, writhing before my eyes. And we were forced to look at him at close range. He was still alive when I passed him. His tongue was still red. His eyes had not yet extinguished. Behind me, I heard the same man asking again and again, for God's sake, where is God? And from within me, I heard a voice answer, 
Where is God? This is where he is, hanging on the gallows. That night, the soup tasted of corpses. It happened to Jesus. In the fasting, the silence got almost deafening. And then he heard another voice. The text says that it was Satan's voice, but no matter what you call it, it's a voice that you and I have heard too. It's the voice that we often hear when we're wandering in the dark, following the pull of what we thought was God's spirit, looking and listening for God to show up, but not hearing much of anything at all. Maybe this sounds familiar to you as it does to me. Sometimes this voice sounds like, I know you came into this desert to think deeply about a new life, an alternative way of living that will invite you to do strange things like put others first, give up personal gain and even comfort for a cause higher than your own accumulation of material things. But really, What's the point of that? I don't want to have to be the first one to say it, but have you considered that maybe that's a little crazy? Have you thought maybe that you are crazy? Or how noble of you to give up position, power, title, and influence to take an alternative path. But not to be a downer or anything. Without the glaring lights of Times Square to show you where to go, what are you going to do? Don't you think it's just a little overdramatic to walk away from all of that? And you know that Lenten determination you made to tell the truth about your life, to be authentic and vulnerable and real, uh, might not be the smartest avenue to take. I'm not suggesting you lie per se. I just mean, you know, cover things up a bit. Put on a shiny face. Let the world see your best side because nobody wants to hear about hardship and heartbreak after all. Have you heard that voice before? I have. That voice is not the voice of God with whom you and I deeply long to converse but it is the voice that we hear in the desert, in the darkness while we are waiting for a word from God. And it's easy, isn't it, to turn our ears toward those other voices, to launch conversations with those voices when, like Ellie Wiesel, we're finally convinced that God is never gonna show up and God will not ever speak. But don't listen to that voice. Instead, on this first Sunday of Lent, hear this word of hope that the God who came to live among us, to walk our weary way along with us, will not leave us forever in the silence. As we wait for God to speak, we also learn new ways to hear, and we begin to recognize other voices that fill the silence with the holy echo of God's voice. So that when the voice of God sounds, we will immediately recognize it. Remember, it's the first Sunday of Lent, so I have one more confession. Earlier, I read the very short Markan version of this story, but there was one little piece of Mark's version of the story that I left off. Here's the whole thing. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness he was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts. Oh, and there's one little phrase at the end that reads, and the angels waited on him. The angels waited on him. In this passage that speaks so hauntingly of God's silence, there are others who came to be with Jesus to remind him that he did not wait to hear from God in vain. God would show up, and until God did, angels attended. You may feel that you are in a desert, in a place devoid of God's voice, of God's presence, 
maybe even of God's love. In that place where God is silent, wait. Step into the desert that is your life and listen. Listen for the promise that darkness will become light. Listen to the truth that the bitter cold will be banished by warmth. Listen to the reality that loneliness will always become community. Listen to this. Death turns into life and silence will. Silence will become a word from the Lord. Silence will certainly become a word from the Lord. God of the desert and the silence, help us keep listening. Give us the courage to take the next step into the dark, unafraid. Please, let us hear your voice in the silence. And while we're waiting, let us remind each other that you will finally speak. Amen.